Fantastic. So look at uh, open to First John chapter two. We're walking through um, our study in First John, and it's already been very rich. And I'm excited um, to continue uh, with you. So we're in chapter two and verses one through uh, fourteen. If someone feels like they'd like to read for us today and serve us in that way, I would love that. First John two one through fourteen. Uh, yeah. I even have sheets for the next section yet, but I'm not giving them out yet, all right? So I'm getting ready for that. Um, but yeah, cr- genuine Christians obey and love. Let me get one of those for me, and then thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. Thanks. All right, yeah, someone uh, want to read for us? My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you, because the darkness is passing, and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light, but hates his brother, is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear dear children, because you have known the fathers. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. Well, I probably can stop there. I'm not, not, quite, not quite there yet, but it's very, very good. Thank you so much, Jim. Appreciate that. All right. All right, so we've already uh, done uh, some work in this chapter. Uh, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, and we've talked about that. Uh, one of the purposes of Scripture always is to prevent sin before it happens. It is a wonderful thing that sin can be forgiven. It is a wonderful thing that we can be atoned for, that we have an advocate with the Father. We have the atoning work, but it's better not to sin. You know, when, no one will ever look back at sin and say, boy, that was a good thing that I did that. So glad that I sinned. I write this to you so that you uh, will not sin. But we need to understand Unfortunately, we're going to sin. We don't need to. We're not slaves to sin, but we, are, we have been set free. Um, Romans 7 it basically implies we never need sin again, ever, as a Christian, but we're going to sin, uh, sadly. And if we do sin, we have an advocate uh, who intercedes for us, who pleads uh, on our behalf, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is also the propitiation for our sins. He is pleading, as the hymn says, the merits of his blood on, the, on behalf of our our condition. His blood is enough to cover our sins, infinitely so. Then we get to the issue of assurance based on what? In verses three through six, what is the basis of Christian assurance in those verses? We know that we have come to know him. That's assurance, right? How do I know if I'm a Christian? Well, we know that we've come to know him if what? So it comes down to our obedience. You can look at your life, and if you're characterized by obedience, then you're a Christian. Would you say that's what he's teaching here? If someone is characterized by disobedience to Christ's commands, what would John say? If you say, I know him, but you don't do what he commands, what does John say about you? You are a liar and the truth is not in you. Now, that's very strong language. Why do you think John uses such shocking language? If any man says, I know him, but doesn't obey him, that man's a liar. Why do you think he uses that kind of language? I mean, that's not very nice. What do you guys think? 
be sure to do one thing you don't accept that you shouldn't do. Okay. It gets you, it gets you attention. So okay. that you focus on it. All right. It's a sharp night. Yeah, it's a wake-up call. You hear, you're a liar. I mean, imagine if someone said that to your face. That's pretty sharp, right? That's a, a shocking moment. If someone calls you a liar, for some people, that would be, uh, you know, a grounds to start a fight. You know, no, we don't do that kind of thing. We're well-mannered people, but it would get on our nerves. Someone calls us a liar. But this is the apostle, John, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he's not saying this person or that person or anyone's a liar. He's saying, if you meet these conditions, and what are the conditions by which John's going to call you a liar? You have to meet certain conditions, bad conditions. What are they? Don't keep his commands. You're claiming to be a Christian, but you're disobeying his commands. All right? Now, do you all, any of you see a problem with this? We're all guilty of that. All right, then <laughs> we're all liars, right? It's like, well, I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. I perfectly keep your commands. Anyone want to say that? Well, you'd be in one of Jesus' parables at that point, you know? <laughs> yeah, so that's the problem with 1 John in general. It's got perfectionistic tendencies, right? So how do we answer the problem that Romans 7 brings up that all of us from time to time disobey his commands? Would you say that that's true? Every Christian from time to time disobeys the commands of God. That's true. Uh, which, what's another name for that? Disobeying the commands of God. Sin. That's sin. So we all sin, all right? Everyone does. How do we harmonize that? If you're a Christian, you will keep his commands. But we don't perfectly keep them. How do we harmonize that? Well, the way Paul does that, God We ask God to forgive us, definitely. End of 1 John 1. Go ahead, Rick, sorry. Uh, the way Paul does it in uh, Romans 7 is he acknowledges that not only is he bad, he's real bad, he refers to himself as wretched, right. uh, but thanks be to God, I mean, he recognizes how the greatness of God, and so in that sense, I think he breaks out with it. Yeah, for sure. Um, would, you say, would you say that Paul, let's use the language of, of the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, that in Romans 7, Paul hungers and thirsts for righteousness. Does Paul yearn to be obedient. Yeah. Do you see that in Romans 7? Yeah. The very thing I hate, I do. And the things that I want to do, that I yearn to do, that I think are delightful and beautiful, I don't do. So that would be a way to start harmonizing these things. A Christian delights in God's law, sees the beauty of it, yearns to fulfill it, laments when they don't. All right, so that kind of gets in between these two aspects of the liar who's just not a Christian. And then the perfect person who never disobeys God's commands, but there's none of those people. In between is a hungering and thirsting and yearning for righteousness. But is that all? Is that enough to hunger and thirst and yearn? Is John talking here about hungering and thirsting and yearning to obey? Well, no, he says, we know that we have come to know him if what? We actually obey his commands, right? So there, is actual, there are actual examples of this person obeying the commands of God. They actually do what God has commanded them to do. Not perfectly, but they do, all right? What would be examples of this that you see? Somebody's converted now, they're a new Christian, and the Holy Spirit's been at work in them for a little while, and there actually is obedience in their lives. Like what? What does it look like? I think of the uh, gospel hymn, Trust and Obey, the words that are in that, because you're walking in his word. You're trusting in him to lead you and guide you to where you need to be, um, and you're being obedient to that. So daily time in the word and prayer, show, come into church. They're reading the Bible, praying. They're confessing their sins right? They're going to church. There's a clear command, right? Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as some are in the habit of doing. So they actually, they come. They're actually there. What other things? If they sin, they ask forgiveness. They confess it. First John 1, 9, they're going to confess their sins. Yeah, there's a whole array of behaviors that are going to start 
changing. They're going to start doing certain things. Um, and they're going to, uh, you know, bring their lives into this pattern of obedience. You know, a great picture of this is, is going to be Jesus assembling his early disciples, right? Remember? Um, Peter, John, James, and Andrew, all four of them were, were what? Professionally. What did they do for a living? Fishermen. Do you remember how they first, you know, met Jesus as he's walking by? What, what happened that day? They're, they're there by the Sea of Galilee. They're mending their nets, preparing their nets. What happened? Jesus said, follow me. So what did they do? They did. They followed him. <laughs> okay. I mean, that was a physical thing, right? They left their boats and their nets and followed Jesus. Same thing with Matthew, the tax collector, right? He walked by him one day at the tax collector's booth. What did he say? Follow me. Follow me. And what did Matthew do? He walked away. I don't know who did his job the rest of the day, but that didn't seem to be much on Matthew's mind. He's like, no, this is the time for me to walk away from this life and to start following Jesus. So that's a very physical, practical thing, to come and be with him. But that's what happens. When someone's converted, they're going to start following Jesus you know, and we can't do it physically like they could, but there's a change that starts happening in your life. So we can't do this kind of thing where, you know, you came forward at a, at a church service or at a, you know, a evangelistic thing and you prayed a prayer, but your life is the exact same it ever was. Ne- never changed, all right? You know, they, they prayed a prayer, but they, they, there was no change made in life. John's writing against that here. If that's you, he's saying, you're a liar. You're not a Christian. That's what he's getting at. Any other comments about this? All right, so what, what then would this create, what, what does this create in the heart of a genuine Christian when you read these words? Listen again to what it says. We know that we've come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we're in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. So a genuine Christian reading that, what's going to happen in that person's heart? Assurance. Assurance. Okay. Assurance. It's a seeking to obey. I mean, when I read it, it, it makes me, it shows me that I'm, I don't do the best job. And it makes me want to obey him more. All right. Do you think that what this, that's a great answer. Do you think that what this does is it, you know, first of all, we have to find out what the commandments are, right? We got to know what they are. We can't obey what we don't know, right? John 14, 21, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. So you got to first have his commands. How do you have his commands? How do you find out what his commands are? There? All right, why don't you put it into words, all right? You have a Bible. You know what the Ten Commandments are? Red letter Bible. Red letter Bible. Red letter Bible. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll greatly shorten how much obedience you need. Just do the red letters, you know, then you're in good shape. Yeah, you've got to read the Bible. So does it actually then affect how you read the Bible? This concept should affect, when you read a passage of Scripture, you should be trying to hear Jesus give you a command in there somewhere. Let me give you an example. I'll I'll bring you to the scripture memory I'm doing right now. I'm not going to recite, though, in front of you. I wouldn't do that. I'd humiliate myself. But um, let me just read a section of scripture and see if you can convert it to a command, if it even needs conversion. I'll just just, uh, uh, just read a section here, and you tell me if, if you can find a command in here somewhere. Okay? Um... Uh, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he had finished, uh, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. And then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are in bed with me. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend. Yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if a son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? 
Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Can you find a command in there somewhere for you? Something you should obey. Bold thing you got. Okay. Well, maybe you were saying it. What, what were you saying? Ask. All right. Yeah. Well, I'll just read this. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. Are those commands from Jesus to you? I think so. I think so. They're commands. What's he telling you to do? Ask. Ask what? What are you supposed to ask? What, are you should, be, what should you be seeking for? What should you be knocking about? Alan, what do you think? What's the answer? What's the ask, seeking, and knocking? Um, the will of God. Okay, so you need to do some more reading to find out what that is. All right, well, you could go to Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Is there anything you should be asking, seeking, and knocking about that? For the king, king. For the kingdom to come? Yeah. Well, has it? Has the kingdom come yet? It's on its way. So it's not done yet. Apparently, we're still supposed to pray for God's kingdom to come. What does that entail for his kingdom to come? Well, it entails evangelism and missions, right? All right, you start to see there's some obedience that starts to unfold here. I should be praying about God's kingdom to come. I should be praying for his name to be hallowed. What does that mean, hallowed be your name? Hallowed, that's kind of an interesting word, hallowed. May God's name be hallowed. Hallowed. Honored. May God's name be honored. Be honored, it's passive. So we can actually insert people in there, right? May people honor your name, God. But they don't. People aren't honoring God's name, right? Think about our country. Think about things that are going on. Should we care about the fact that God's name is not held in honor? We should care about that. All right, so I could keep going like this for a while. How long do you think I could keep going on? Like I could go on like this the rest of the time. How many commands do you think you could find if you had a regular pattern of Bible reading where you're like, man, I need to be praying about these things. So a Christian reads the Bible that way, right? Let's say, for example, I read to you the parable of the Good Samaritan. I won't. That's also in my scripture memory stuff right now. Is there a command for you in there somewhere? Do likewise. Do likewise. Which would be what? Love your neighbor as yourself. If someone is in need, and I see that need today, help me to meet it. As a matter of fact, you could actually get ahead of that and say, God, would you, would you orchestrate my path today so I walk by someone that needs my help? orchestrate my path so I'm like this good Samaritan that sees the guy bleeding by the side of the road and helps him. Could be a motorist, could be just a person, could be a church member who comes up and says, I'm going through a hard time. And you're like, all right, this is the moment I prayed about. So you put down what you're doing, right? Like you remember the good Samaritan? Was he in any way inconvenienced by that bleeding guy by the side of the road? Was it, was it a game changer for him? Did he change his plans? Let me ask, ask you that way. Was his day changed? Yeah, entirely. His whole day was changed. And so was his night, and so was later when he came back to find out how he was doing. In his purse. In his purse. He gave money, he gave time, he gave of himself. How would he even say his eternity was changed? Yeah, we'd have to say that. But as we look at it, I, I also think, not only am I looking for something to obey, I frequently read scripture for something that I should be convicted about. Right? Have you ever, do you think you've ever played the role of the priest or the Levite walking by somebody that needed help and you never noticed? Do you think that's ever happened in your life? Where you've walked by someone that could have used some help and you just kept on going? Yeah, I would say we've all done that. So I read scripture because I want to find some way to repent and to start being more obedient than I've been before. Does that make sense? And how long is that going to go on, that process of reading scripture like that? The rest of your life. So this is an overall umbrella to cover all of this, but it's is the, the uh, walking in righteousness, seeking to be holy, 
and which you can't do any of that if you're not if you're not in the church, if you're not in the scriptures, yeah. uh, if you're not walking with him, if he's not in you or you and him. So it just covers a whole regiment of things that you do yeah. to learn, to seek, to walk, yeah. to be, to live. Amen. And I think it all starts with an attitude and disposition of understanding who you are and who God is and what your life is all about and why you're even here at all. So let me give you another command that I think probably precedes everything. You could find a lot of them, but this, I'll give you this one. Uh, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to present your bodies to God as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Present your body to God as a living sacrifice. What does that mean to do that? To present your body to God as a living sacrifice. Well, I, I look at it as what we're supposed to take care of, what he's given us. Um, you know, I, I feel like we go and, and abuse it, we will, we will, he will let us know about it. Well, let me zero in on the word present. It's like a soldier showing up to a commanding officer, right? What does the word present mean there in that context? Offer it to him, present it to him. Use this as you see fit. Yeah, it's like to him, take my life and let it be, right? You're saying that to God. I am giving myself to you. Now, how often do you think you could pray a prayer like that? God, I'm giving my body to you right now. How often could you pray that? Once a morning? Every morning, in the morning. Will that do it? (laughs) Do you think you could do it an hour after your quiet time was done? Kind of like, God, by the way, I'm still presenting my body to you as a living sacrifice. Like, how much of the day does he want? What, 24 hours? He wants it all, all the time. And so that you would recognize that you are God's slave. Remember how we began Titus 1.1? 1, 1? Someone read that again. Re- read that. Uh, just remember the first verse. I know we already been through Titus. So you guys all remember Titus very well. I remember that because we went through that. Titus 1.1. 1, 1. Someone read that. Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect. Okay, you've already read it. So just the first few words. And change the word servant to slave. Try that. Read it again, Rick. Paul, a slave of God. Stop right there. Paul, a slave of God. Uh, We talked about that for a while. What does that mean when Paul says, Paul, a slave of God? I'm God's slave. What does a slave do with his day? It's like, gee, I think I'll do what today? What are your plans today? Slave A to slave B. They're like, whatever. What do you think? What does it mean to be a slave to God? Well, you, you empty your will of what you want to do with your life, and you, you dedicate your body and your life to what God wants okay. to accomplish through you. So would you, I agree with that. Would you say then that every moment of every day for every Christian should be a matter of obedience? They're obeying some command at that moment. Yeah. All right. When do they get time off? Like it's a nine to five job? When does 501 happen? Where you're like, all right, I'm done with that now. I can do my own thing. When, when do you get to say, all right, I've done you all day. Now I'm, I'm on my own. I'm off the clock. <laughs> the whistle will never blow. It never blows. So what that means is every moment of every day for the rest of your life, you're either going to be obeying God or what? Disobeying. Which is called what? Sin. Sinning. You're either obeying or sinning. And that's hard to hear, isn't it? Because we have a view of freedom in America, a view of autonomy, of self-definition that's probably unbiblical, I would say, where we're defining what we want to do today. You know, um, I've got a, a parable I'm about to, about to memorize. I'm in Luke 17, so I did 17, 1 through 3, but it's coming up, and I know what it says. And it's one of the most convicting parables um, that uh, can someone read that Luke seventeen seven through ten? It's really amazing. It, it really it bothers me. The parable bothers me, my flesh, in ways that most parables don't. But it kind of kind of annoys annoys me. But it's helpful. I need to hear it. So Luke seven seventeen seven through ten. Suppose one of you has a servant plow and you're looking at the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, "Come along now, sit down to eat"? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get ready, and get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? 
After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Wow. What is Jesus saying in that parable? We're holy guys for his purpose. So the servant was out in the field working all day, all day, comes in, and would the master say, look, you've worked hard all day. Tell you what, you sit down and you eat. I'm going to get you dinner. Is that what he's going to say? No. He'll say, now you come in, now you cook for me, right? And you feed me. And after that, then you may eat. And by the way, I'm not going to thank you for anything you did today. The best you can hope to do is say, I'm an unworthy servant that only did my duty today. That's the whole parable. What is the point of that parable? What, why does Jesus teach that parable? What's he saying in that parable? That's the kind of obedience we should have for God. There's never a time off. And there's never a time where he owes you thanks. Ever. It kills your pride when you read that. If you absorb that parable, you're like, wow, that's a whole different way of looking at life than I'm used to. I find it hard, but I know it's right. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus live that way toward his father? Yeah. He did. Yeah. He did everything the father wanted to do, no matter how difficult it was. Do you see that? Even to the point of dying on the cross. That's the kind of life he wants us to live. And I'm telling you, it, it, it flies against my sense of freedom and self-ownership and autonomy, but I know it's right. We were made to be servants, weren't we? And we're either going to serve God or serve Satan. And I don't want to serve Satan. I want to serve him. So that goes back now to 1 John 2, and you look at it and it says, we know that we've come to know him if we obey him. If we obey him. If we obey his commands. So how do we up our game? Let's say we, you know, we, we have not been very obedient. We've been autonomous. We've been doing our own thing with our time, energy, money. We've been whatever. But now we're convicted. We say, all right, I want to obey. How do we get there? How do we make changes? Well, I can share with you some words that you said. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> what did I say? All right, go ahead. Uh, many years ago, you said uh, that we should pray every day uh, for spiritual wisdom, understanding, in order to live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit with every good work, growing in knowledge, giving thanks to the Father who qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints and to uh, rescue what they thank Him for rescuing us from the dominion of the darkness. Amen. Yeah, every moment. That's what I yearn, I yearn to do. Thank you, Lynn. I think it starts with humility confession say lord i want to obey i do but i know that i'm characterized often by selfish disobedience and i don't want to be that way i want to repent i want to live a more obedient life and so you're offering yourself to him and to obey right now you know and that's one thing i've also learned is you can't obey yesterday and you can't obey tomorrow all you can do is obey today right now you can get ready to obey tomorrow, and you can lament past disobedience, but the obey moment is right now. That's what you've got today. If today you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. I think that's what we've got to learn. Okay? All right, so let's keep going. Any other comments about this obedience? Yeah, Clay? Pastor Davis, I think it, I feel it's interesting that, you know, it says that if anyone obey his word, I go back and I remember hearing the pastor share about two and a half years ago that they said ins insert when we like I think of the, the book of James the first chapter it says when if anyone um, you know lacks wisdom instead of saying if anyone when you lack wisdom ask him ask God the Father they said try and insert when you lack that wisdom when you um, you know uh, and they said Try, try doing that and see how it makes you feel better as a, as a person who follows Jesus. Thank you. 
I had not thought about that before. I appreciate that, Clay. But, verse five, if anyone obeys God's word, God's love is truly made complete in him. What does that mean to you? If you obey God's word, his love is truly made complete in you. That's this translation. Anyone have a different translation? Anybody with the ESV on verse uh, five? Someone else read something other than the NIV. I have King James. Okay, go ahead. Um, but whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Perfected. All right, perfected. If anyone keeps God's word, truly God's love is perfected in him. Any thoughts on that? What does that mean? It means that we would find ourselves experiencing the love of God, both our love for him and his love for us, simply through obedience. Amen. I think one way, thanks, Rick, that is very helpful. One way that I'm helped is to think about obedience in terms of law. We obey commands. And the two great commandments as a summary of all of God's law. And the two great commandments are what? Love. love, vertical love, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, horizontal, love your neighbors yourself, right? That will be perfected in you if you obey his commands. So that's what's gonna happen. If you have a disposition to obey, God is gonna expand, I think, through the Holy Spirit, your love for God, you'll love him more and more, and it will expand horizontally your love for others. Do you think John would agree with that? That if you are, have a pattern of obedience in your life and that actually is happening by the Spirit, five years from now you will love God more than you do now and you will love your neighbor more than you do now. That will be happening. Yes. Yeah, Rick. Yeah, I think the challenge is in finding a way to be obedient without being committed to the law yeah. and missing the honor of God. Yeah, amen. Amen. Tell me more about that, because that's like legalism. You're going into this legalistic way of living life. Yeah, and I find that it happens. Uh, yeah. Time to time, a regular. I mean, I think it's the difference between my... Well, I think the answer is in looking at God mm -hmm. through Scripture yeah. in other ways mm -hmm. and appreciating Him so much in doing so right. that you're then motivated to serve God sure. as opposed to... Yeah, that's such a good point. I mean, the goal of all of this, of the whole thing, Bible study of the Christian life is love. Loving God and loving each other in heaven. That's where we're heading, a world of love. All right, so that's the goal. Let's talk briefly about legalism because this is talking about obedience and I'm talking about law because it makes sense if we're gonna talk about obedience, we're gonna talk about commands. Another word for commands is law. So we need it. Legalism really shows its ugly head when you've disobeyed and you're trying to make that right. You have disobeyed, and if your remedy is works, then that's legalism, right? The idea that you can work your way into forgiveness or a right relationship with God is the essence of that kind of legalism, right? So I've articulated it this way, that kind of legalism, I would say that, that you cannot use present and future obedience to God's law to pay for past disobedience to God's law, right? Because you can't ever do anything pleasing to God that he didn't already command you to do. Therefore, there's no extra credit. So you can't use right now's obedience to pay for yesterday's disobedience, right? That's impossible. Therefore, the only forgiveness there could ever be is by faith in Christ's blood shed on the cross alone. The thief on the cross is the picture of that. You can't do anything to make it right. You just, by grace, through faith, look to Jesus crucified as your atoning sacrifice. Does that make sense? So you can't work your way back into forgiveness and all that. But let's say you have trusted in Christ, you're justified, you're forgiven, but you're asking a different question. God, what is the best way for me to spend my time today? Do you think obedience would be the answer to that? What is the best way to spend my day? My time, my energy, my money. I think the king would say, obey me today. And we would say, yes, that's the life I wanna live. And I think that's what John's getting at here. 
the life that we live as true Christians should be a life of obedience. But as Rick's saying, we can never slip into that legalistic mindset saying, the way that I earn my relationship with him and my love with him is by obedience. That is not the case. All right, thank you. That's a good point. All right, so God's love is truly made perfect in us. Would we say that God's love is perfected in us now? Or is there still some perfecting of God's love that still needs to happen? Okay. So there's still yet more ways we could feel and experience the love of God for us and more ways we could be more loving ourselves, right? We could both understand and accept the love God has for us better than we do and we could live a more loving life than we do. That's what the word perfected means to me. All right, so if you obey, that's the way to go at it. And there's no other way. There isn't. Let's say you say, I want God's love perfected in me, but I also want to be disobedient along the way. I mean, what would 1 John 2, 5 say to you? Yeah, it's not going to happen, man. <laughs> the way toward God's love being perfected in you, you have both a sense of his love for you and you are living a more loving life toward him and toward others is by obedience. It's by obedience. And, and, and just obedience in the pattern of Christ. Didn't Jesus obey his father every day? Think about that. Didn't he say effectively, Psalm 40, here I am, it is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do your will, O God. How many of Jesus' days did he say that to his father? Effectively, every day. And that's how I want to live too, right? I want to do your will, Father. I want to please you. All right, and that's what he's talking about here. All right, this is how we know that we're in him. Now, verse six, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. That's why I keep talking about Jesus and his father, right? I want us to set Jesus up as our role model. I want his life of obedience to be my pattern, all right? Do you see that in Philippians chapter two? Have this mind in you which was also in Christ, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a what? A servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became what? Obedient, Obedient. even to death, even death on a cross. So that is, to walk as Jesus walked means to live an obedient life. Any thoughts you guys have on this on verse six? Whoever claims to live in Jesus must walk as Jesus did. We obviously can walk like he did, but we can strive to. Okay. What does the word walk mean to you in verse six? Is that Follow. Word? Follow, okay. He said, Ultimately, the goal is, I think the word walk to me is left foot, right foot, left foot. It's very practical. It's like, how am I living practically? What is my daily life? You know, you talk about somebody's walk, right? What, is, what do we mean by when we talk about somebody's, what's their walk like? What does that mean, the word walk? Patterns, habits, daily life. So we are supposed to imitate Jesus's walk. So how do we do that and how can we not do that? And there's some things we just can't imitate, right? What would be some examples of things we cannot imitate? Miracles. All right, miracles, right? Although Peter, you know, is like, he did walk on the water that one time. So that was, that was an interesting walk as Jesus did. But we're not going to get up and do a bunch of healings today. Then what is the walk we're supposed to imitate here? Just simply put, it's obedience. It's just obey. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's one decision at a time, one, okay. uh, one, one moment at a time. Okay. Yeah. Remind me of paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It Rick. also includes the suffering. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. No, please, Chris. Go ahead. It also includes the suffering because in First Peter 2, he says that if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So his steps of walking were a suffering road. 
That's a good word, in his steps, and that's a road of suffering. Rick, go ahead. It seems to me we should focus moment by moment on loving God, and if we do that, the rest, I think, takes care of itself. Yeah. Yeah, and I think actually for me, thank you, Rick, that's so good. For me, part of the incarnation, the central reason why Jesus, the word, became flesh is so that he could die on the cross. He would have blood that he could shed on the cross. But it's not the only reason. One of, them, one of the reasons is to give us a pattern of physical life in this world that we can follow, that we can imitate, right? He can be a role model for us. That's that incarnational life. It's like he lived among us and, and he knew what it was like to be hungry. He was tempted in every way as we are without sin. He, he lived that physical life. So hold on to this thought in verse six and let's go on to verse seven and eight and then I'll come back to verse six. Seven and eight is interesting. John is kind of kicking around whether the command he's giving is new or old. It's like, well, it's old or is it new? All right, he says, dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one which you've had since the beginning. This old command is the message you've heard. Yet, uh, you know, on the other hand, I actually am writing a new command. <laughs> so, you know, which is it? Is it an old command or is it a new command? Let me finish the thought. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the light, the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. So, Let's, let's talk about this idea of old command, new command. So put your finger here in 1 John and go to John 13. And in John 13, and uh, read verse 34 and 35. John 13, 34 and 35. The new command I give you, love one another. As I love you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. All right, so there's the word new. Do you see it? Connected with the word command. A new command I give you. And what is that new command in John 13, 34? Love each other. Love one another. Is that a new command? Not really. Not really. Doesn't it sound a lot like the second great commandment that Jesus said summed up the law and the prophets? Love your neighbor as yourself. So it's an old command. But what's the new part in verse 34? John 13, 34, what is the new aspect? As I have loved you. That's it. Do you see the newness here? As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So the new aspect is Jesus' lifestyle of love. That's what's new. It's an old commandment now illustrated and empowered and displayed in a very new way, right? So let's, let's talk about this. I, I've discussed this before. An average day in the life of Jesus during his ministry, let's say a year before he was crucified, all right? Let's say he just got up and what? What was his day? What did his day look like? He gets up a great while before dawn, we're told in Mark, and does what? He's alone with the Father, he's praying, he's interceding, he's, you know, he's in the Father's presence. And then he starts to interact with people, right? What do, what do those interactions look like? There is a common theme to Jesus' day. Do you remember the paralyzed man with the four friends? And the four friends had a logistical problem? Do you remember what the logistical problem was like? Yeah, the logistical problem was the crowd. And the answer was digging through the roof. How often do you think Jesus was besieged by huge quantities of people? Every single day. What were they there for? Why did they come? What was the urgency to them wanting to be near Jesus? Mostly healings, I would say. Were they there for the doctrine? They wanted to hear the teachings. Some of them, but not most of them. Were they expecting to be fed? No, he didn't do that consistently. So would you say that news had spread of a healer who was 100% effortlessly effective and cost nothing? Do you think that word spread? Yes. Yeah. All right, so let's say you came and you didn't get seen yesterday. Did you go home? No, no probably not. <laughs> so you're there the next day, and so Jesus' day after his time with his father begins. And I also noted that Jesus, it seems, preferred to heal people one at a time. 
I don't have any examples of any mass healings. So that meant a touch, a word, a sense of their misery, a sense of like a conversation with a leper. If you're willing, you can make me clean. I am willing, he said. He reached out and touched him and said, be clean. Leper's done. Is his day over now? Jesus' day? There was somebody standing behind him. Somebody right behind him. (laughs) What did that show you about Jesus' day and how does that display love? How do you see love in that? Interruptible. Interruptible, okay. Well, you sure to see him as a servant. Yeah. Yeah, it was all about them, not him. Do you see the two great commandments in that in, in Jesus' day? Do you see vertical and horizontal love? Yeah. Every moment. Remember when Jairus came and his daughter was dying? And Jesus said what? He said, I'll go, you know, I'll go and heal her, right? So he gets up and goes. I mean, it's like, that's where Chris says he's interruptible, right? So there is no pattern. So you, you look at Luke 17, 7 through 10, and we find it irksome, and it's like, whatever. Jesus lived it. There was never a time that he was done for the day. You see what I'm saying? Never. Do you remember the time when he heard news that his friend, his relative, John the Baptist, had been beheaded? What did Jesus want to do at that moment? Get away and pray. No doubt in my mind he wanted to do that. So he gets into a boat and crosses over. But it's not a long journey for the crowd. And when he arrives, who's waiting for him? Same crowd he just left. And he welcomed them. And he taught them. And he healed them. And then he fed them. That was feeding the 5,000. What does that show about he wanted to be alone? There's no doubt. Because when he was done teaching and feeding and healing, he sent them away and went up in a mountain and prayed. All right? So he wanted to be alone, but he put his own self aside. You see what I'm saying? And gave. How do you see the two great commandments in that example? He wanted to vertically pray to God, but instead he horizontally prayed to help heal the other people. And how much of the day did he give to that? 100%. All of it. And the next day, all of it. And the next day, and the next day. Well, Until, go ahead, Chris. Uh, but if he neglected the first part of it, the second part's going to be a whole lot harder or it's going to peter out after an hour or two. It's true. Because then you're on your own strength. Yeah. And you have some strength for a while. You really do. Yeah. But it goes away. Yeah, and Chris, I'm going to absolutely agree with what you just said. And we get to look behind the scenes in John because in John's gospel he said, I don't do anything except what the Father's told me to do. I don't teach anything except what the Father told me to say. I don't do anything apart from the will of the Father. And so, yeah, I think he got his marching orders in those early morning times, and then he abided with the Father throughout the day, but he did, and then you're right, he did it. So it was vertical, horizontal all the time. All I'm saying is there was no third part of the day. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There was just no third part of the day. What I've been taken in with in Luke's gospel is how many meals he had with the Pharisees. He ate through three different accounts in Luke of him eating meals with the Pharisees, and he chewed them out all three times. <laughs> it's just interesting. It's like he goes to this guy's house and chews him out. And it's because he needed to be chewed out. I mean, Jesus didn't ever do anything wrong. But I'm saying even his meals were working meals, right? He's there. He's like, I've got a job to do here. And he knew this meal is not going to end well. It's going to end with them hating me and being angry at me. But I still have to do it. I still have to say, woe to you, Pharisees, because you're like unmarked graves. He's going to do that. And he's going to kind of ruin the evening by telling the truth. But that was, he was never off. And he kept doing this and kept doing it day after day after day after day until the time came for him to drink the cup the Father gave him and die. That was his life. All right, now you go back to 1 John or to John 13, 34. A new command I give you, love each other as I have loved you. And he does link it to his death. Greater love has no one than this, that he what? Lay down his life for his friends. John's going to tell this later in 1 John. He says the pattern of loving is is Jesus laying down his life, the way he died. That's what we should do for each other. That's the newness of this command. Does that make sense? So if you look at 1 John 3, 6, he says then, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Do you have any sense of how difficult that verse is? 
I mean, think about it. First John 2, 6. Do you find that it's almost like walk on water? Mm-hmm. <laughs> guys, anyone, anyone want to comment on, now that I've laid out what I perceive to be an average day in the life of Jesus' ministry, and now we're told here in First John 2, 6, we've got to live like that? Walk as Jesus did. Do you have any thoughts on that? My healings haven't been going very well lately. <laughs> <laughs> The crowds have not been sent away happy. <laughs> they don't, they don't go away. Well, I think that one of the big differences, Chris, is that you and I can't attract the crowd to begin with. All right? <laughs> Nobody, no word has gone out. <laughs> no, no, it's it's good. Jim, oh, I'm sorry. Did you say something? Yeah, it's very humbling. It's, it's an impossible task. I, but I think we're supposed to take First John two six and many other verses like it, and we're supposed to take them to God in prayer as spiritual beggars. I go do the Beatitudes. Blessed are the spiritual beggars who have nothing in their hands. Blessed are the meek who know they have nothing to offer. Blessed are the, those who mourn, who they, they know that they're not living a holy life. They're not. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the pure in heart. You look at all that and you're like, man, that's how I would take 1 John 2, 6 in prayer. Say, all right, Lord, today I want to walk as Jesus walked, but that's impossible. I'm so selfish, I'm so carnally minded, so worldly minded, but I want that. That's what I want. Romans does teach us that the fulfillment of the law is love. Uh, it runs through the commandments, but then it says, mm. it's summarized and love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So mm-hmm. for me, it would, it would feel like that living in that obedience is just finding creative, and deep and meaningful ways to just love other people Amen. and do it, you know, from a motivation of Christ. Amen. Amen. And I, I agree. I agree with that. Keep in mind that <clears throat> that putting it all together, that I've defined love as a heart attraction like a magnet toward a person or God, resulting in cheerful sacrificial action. So it's both the heart aspect of attraction, heart attraction. Love is a heart motion towards somebody. It's from the heart. But it's got to be in actions. There's got to be actions that come from it. Sacrificial actions, right? Why do I say that there is something that's apart from the action that is essential to love? I get that from 1 Corinthians 13.3. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not what? Love. So there's a heart disposition behind the actions. He doesn't just want the actions and he doesn't just want the feelings. He wants the feelings plus the action. That's biblical love. That's a high calling, isn't it? So how do you have the feelings first? It's like, you know, Chris, you spent your career in Bangladesh mostly, I would say. Was it entirely in Bangladesh? No, nine years in India, 10 years ago. That's what I thought. Did you always have that heart attraction toward the people you were ministering to? Definitely not. So how do, you, how do you address that? You know, it's like, I want to love these people. And that's the First Corinthians 13, 3. I want, I want to sacrifice and give, but I want to do it from a heart that's full, that loves them. Do you have a thought, any thought on that? Uh, perseverance was, you know, like, okay. Sometimes I, many times I, I forced myself, or I attempted to force myself. You know, my... I don't know how to phrase it exactly how I think about it because I even think about that now. But, you know, I'm some part of my body is not willing to do this, but I know from Scripture this is the thing to be doing. So I will, I'm going to press forward and do it and pray for humility and pray for a change of spirit so that I, it turns into being willing to do it. The, another item was inertia. Uh, that was that's huge. Where many times I don't want to leave the house. It's comfortable, whatever. Um, you know, for whatever reason, it's, uh, I, I don't feel like going out today or tonight. Usually, you did your visiting in the evening. But once you went out, it's like, oh, I'm glad I went out. You know, something good happened or something good, something minor. You know, it was worthwhile. So it was that get that first step. Yeah. And um, I didn't always do that, take that first step, but. When I did, more times than not, I cold, but glad we were able to do this. Yeah, I love what you're saying because in, practically, 
you can't necessarily wait for the feelings to be there. Sometimes you just have to obey what you know you're supposed to do. And then the feelings will come. But it's not okay for the feelings never to be there. You know, because that's where First Corinthians 13.3 comes in. It's like you, you got to have that heart attraction, that feeling. Because then he goes on to say love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast. There's dispositions. You're going to say more? Okay. I would, I would say that Jesus didn't feel like getting on the cross that day. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually wonder sometimes if there's that picture of the uh, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant uh, under Joshua when they're about to cross the, the Jordan at flood stage, remember? And they had to step in the river and then it miraculously split open for them. Remember that? So God waited for them to take that step when there was apparently nothing other than river at flood stage. So like, what's the, what's the plan here? I don't know. I'm just going to step into the river. <laughs> we'll see what happens. And then what happened? The water heaped up, remember? And they crossed over on dry ground. But that, I think that's significant to what Chris is saying. You, sometimes you may not have those feelings, but you've got to take that step of obedience and do what you know you're supposed to do. So what did visiting mean, by the way? You used the word visiting. What, what would that mean for you, visiting? Oh, um, I, that was one of my favorite things to do, ultimately, because in... In Asia, as a man, you could go and just hang out with people. And it was very social, very, many, many people were on the street all the time. So I had my circle of friends, if you will, which was quite, was rather large. But I would go to someone's store, just sit. Mm -hmm. They may or may not give me tea, they usually did. Mm -hmm. You know, we would just talk. I didn't have to buy anything. Sometimes I did, but I didn't have to. And so I would do that type of visiting. And then, um, but I had multiple people. This guy does my typing in Bangla. This guy does my tailor. You know, this guy does something else. So that's my connection with them. Wow. But then you build from that and say, now, you know, let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about this yes, bridge God. between Islam and Christianity. So we would, well, I would do that. I just want to thank you for what you shared and um, thank you for the way you served our Lord in a very difficult place for many years. And it's just an honor, Chris, to have you, both of you, here today. And uh, I'm thankful. But I like, I like what you're saying, you know. We have to obey. We have to step out and obey. And, and this verse tells us to walk as Jesus did. But I, I, I sought today in this Bible study to give you a sense of what a high calling that really is. It's not a small thing to imitate Jesus because his example is perfect. It soars higher than we can imagine but this is the calling and you know what's amazing we are actually as christians predestined to be conformed to the image of christ think about that you are going to end up as perfect and obedient and loving as jesus in heaven think about that that's incredible so chris would you mind closing our time in prayer today thank you Dear God, we thank you so much for this day, for what you teach us every day. We thank you for uh, your patience and your mercy for us, because we see in this passage and so many others we need it. Mm -hmm. Lord, we thank you so much that you care for us and that this is what you want for us, so help us to want it even more, or just as much. Lord, let us seek after you uh, today and every day. Thank you for the time together with these gentlemen. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.